side section was one of the dearest people I've ever known. Because of her interest in local history and genealogy, family and friends have begun the process of establishing an Agnes H. Haynes Memorial Fund, the interest from which will be available for the purchase of books on local history and genealogy to be added each year to the Society's collection in her memory. Nancy, may I give you the certificate, please? One of our favorite people here. Thank you. You're welcome. Church, John. Yes. I don't know. 
parentage. Yes. Thank you. Is that what that, this is? Yep. It is. You were nervous. <laughs> know what's going on. Who brought this here tonight? Again? Yes, thank you. And your name is? Parker. Does anybody know what this is here? Like an ice shaver. An ice shaver? I can't see it. I'll pass these out, but I'm afraid I won't get them back here. Does it come in pieces? Does it come in pieces? No, I don't. Does it open up? Now imagine it did at one time. It has this little... But what's that head you Bring it back up, John, so we can get a look at it. Will you? Sure thing, Brown. Got your bifocals on here. Is that close enough? No, no, yeah, that's yeah. close enough. <laughs> the ice shaver is this side of the room here. Some kind of iron. <laughs> what is this then? Is this what that is, an ice shaver? That's why I bought it up. <laughs> Used to make uh, pastries, French yes. croissants. This man would know, yes. Yes. The croissant cutter? Thank you. 
fixing a, if you got a tight spot in your shoe, it doesn't fit right. You, so it's, it stretches just one spot in the leather, right? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't, you don't, you don't pull the leather with it, but you just uh, mark it. Bring it up, John, so we can try it, will you? Yes. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got clean socks on? Make room for money. Yeah, that's right. Okay, great. 
That's what we wanted to know. Speak up a little louder. Speak up a little louder. Loud? Yeah. Yes.
members of the Bethel Service Club. Another thing I had not read about. January 7, 1943. Those living upstairs over the years were Daisy and Syl LeClaire. They lived here when first married on April 20th, 1926. And Gilbert LeClaire was born here. Also Milo and Marjorie McAllister. And Glendon McAllister was born here. Clifford and Carrie Merrill lived there. Gardner and Wilma Garner. Mr. and Mrs. Carl Pike. Pat and Paul Carter. Harold Donahue, Alton and Mary Carroll, Lou Bean, Sonny Bean, Bernice Heath, Ruth Fowle, and Edith Howe. Glenn Swan lived downstairs at one time, and later Gladys and Will Bean lived there. And I believe Norma Buck was born there. You might also mention that uh, Rufus Conroy is here tonight. Yes, so, yes. yes. So don't say anything about it. <laughs> This is the David Hunt place. This land belonged to Ethel Hazelton, who lived on Chapman Street. She sold to Ida Hazelton, who sold to Pelly Andrews, and he built the house here in the 1920s. He sold to Mary Brooks of Upton, July 28, 1928. At her death, Agnes Brooks Twaddle, Harry Brooks, and Dee Grover Brooks sold the house to Grace Chamberlain. And a lot of you remember Harold Chamberlain and his store down there. And my friend Libby Bain loved to go in there and ask him what flavors he had. And he would dribble them off just as fast as anything. And we were just about to post. <laughs> and he always had his hand out for your money before you got the comb. <laughs> sold the house to Madeline and Frank Hunt, Jr. On April 28, 1987, Frank Hunt, Jr. and wife, Madeline, sold that to their son, David, who lives out of day with their two children. At one time, Chester Kimball and family lived here. They must have rented.
must have been an artist with dynamo.
Is the community ready, both physically and psychologically, for tourism? These were precisely the questions raised by Birmingham, Alabama, in an aptly named public forum, Destination Birmingham. Painfully aware of its sagging iron industry, Birmingham started to look for new ways to diversify its economy. As part of a broad revitalization effort, the city sponsored Destination Birmingham to assess community sentiment and commitment for increasing tourism development activities. Interest was solid, support strong. Birmingham's vision was translated into a well-articulated plan that has set a course for the wise investment of both time and money. The results have been positive. Private investment in downtown has soared, due in part to local confidence in Birmingham's potential. In the past six years, 80 renovations have restored grace and proportion to a booming downtown. And revitalization of the once deteriorated Five Point South neighborhood has increased commerce, jobs, and quality housing. Sloss Furnace, king of the old pig iron plants, saved by a $3 million bond issue in 1975, now serves as both a functional community resource and local tourist attraction. The Birmingham Historical Society contributes to the cause with its Day in Old Birmingham celebration, opening public buildings and private homes for a close inspection of city heritage. The Convention and Visitors Bureau has appointed a full-time staff person to organize other special events that encourage weekend stayovers. In the tradition of Destination Birmingham, ongoing public meetings provide the vehicle for community input. With its clear sense of direction and enthusiastic citywide support, Birmingham is well on its way to becoming a popular destination indeed. Seattle's success is more fully developed. In the 1960s, historic Pioneer Square, tarnished with crime, was a prime target for demolition and urban renewal. But Seattle citizens objected to such a radical approach and quickly mobilized to save the heart of their city. A few adventurous developers had already proven the economic feasibility of restoring the district's turn-of-the-century structures. Based on this confidence, the city established a public policy responsive to the community's outrage. The Pioneer Square Historic District was set up and a board appointed to review all development, demolition, and rehabilitation activity in the square. In addition, a minimum maintenance ordinance now allows the city to stipulate and even make necessary improvements to neglected structures. Strong incentives complemented the city's controls. In the early 80s alone, Investment tax credits available to district buildings stimulated almost $140 million in private investment. Seattle's firm determination to preserve its heritage helped change Pioneer Square from a place you'd better stay away from to a place you want to be. Within four years, the city's assessed valuation of the district increased 450%. Today, the integrity of Pioneer Square clearly tells the story of Seattle's past, while its vitality creates a dynamic place to live, work, and visit. Until neighboring Port Townsend's lumber mill went on strike in 1978, its economy seemed shock-resistant. That crisis, however, proved the need to diversify the town's economic base. A close look inward showed Port Townsend that it had something unique to market, itself. A well-preserved downtown of Victorian office buildings and neighborhoods of Queen Anne and turn-of-the-century homes provide just the setting in which tourists love to stroll. With a deftly orchestrated preservation and marketing campaign, visitation grew from 25,000 to 63,000 in four years. To complement the lure of Port Townsend's architecture, a calendar of diverse activities encourages repeat visitation. To a salmon derby, a wooden boat festival, a fiddler's hoedown, a kinetic sculpture race, even a Victorian Christmas celebration in the off-season. Convincing proof of Port Townsend's success is the $12 million plus which tourism generated for Jefferson County's economy in 1987. The Chattahoochee River, jaggedly outlining the Alabama-Georgia border, created natural sites for settlements and commerce. In 1978, 
the U.S. Congress approved an interstate compact between the two states to encourage cooperation among communities of the 18 counties along the river to help them organize and promote historic preservation and tourism in the Chattahoochee Valley. The compact established the Historic Chattahoochee Commission. Its first task, to complete an assessment of the area's wide range of resources. Its second, to develop a multifaceted regional tourism program. Six special focus tours interweave the unique assets of various communities along the Chattahoochee, always blending scenic and recreational resources with the historic. Eufaula, Alabama has a rightful role on the Classic Mansion Tour. With 75 buildings protected through listing on the National Register of Historic Places, Eufaula presents an unfaded picture of the antebellum South. The Eufaula Pilgrimage, an April house tour, and organized year-round walking tours complement the attractions of bass fishing tournaments at popular Lake Eufaula. On the Trace Historic Landmarks Tour, Columbus, Georgia provides insight into the region's industrial past. In the late 60s, local preservation sentiment became focused on the endangered Springer Opera House. Once the Grand Ole Theater was saved, residents used the momentum of their success to organize the historic Columbus Foundation, a very important and effective player in gaining citywide support for preservation. Columbus today is an excellent testament to what a solid preservation philosophy in local planning can yield. With a 26-block historic district of offices and residences, a very successful convention and trade center forged from the old Columbus Ironworks, city offices reclaimed from the Riverbank Arsenal, and an interpretive river walk along the Chattahoochee, Columbus demonstrates a real commitment to making its heritage work for its future. All of these examples demonstrate the essential role planning plays in a community's pursuit of tourism. Each is a model in its own right, but none can fully address all the pertinent issues, directions, and concerns. There are several critical tasks from which every effort can benefit. Assess your resources, local and regional, considering what is special, strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities for improvement. Examine existing service facilities and infrastructure, such as road, signage, and parking. Investigate cooperative efforts with neighboring communities. Develop consensus on what is important to residents and determine tourism's place in achieving community development goals. Articulate your vision and design a plan of action. Specifically, protect significant resources with appropriate legislation and controls. Provide incentives to encourage investment and compliance. Create a strong, targeted marketing program and promote local activities, including festivals, celebrations, and cultural events. Seek out guidance from experienced communities and professionals. A successful tourism program does not self-generate or even self-perpetuate. It is a continual, ongoing process that demands a major investment in time, dollars, and energy. But for those communities willing to undertake the challenge, experience shows the relationship between tourism and historic resources can be mutually beneficial. It is Arthur Fromer's words that articulate it best. Tourism does not go to a city that has lost its soul. The cities with well-preserved vestiges of the past attract tourism. Those without do not. Enough said.
helps to the society will transfer them to the preservation committee, which will hopefully look them over and hopefully be good for this uh, uh, conference, which is coming up next month. Uh, one other announcement before we uh, begin. Uh, Randy, uh, this evening, finished the index for the Bethel history. So that means that that will go up tomorrow, and that's the final thing. And uh, we're hoping that uh, uh, they'll have it printed and ready to go to the binary by the end of this month, and hopefully uh, a month of the bindery will do it, and it'll be out the uh, first part of December. That's all, lots of things happening, but uh, we're hoping all is gonna go well. It has before, and that hopefully this will happen, but we all have to see what happens. But it looks like it's pretty good that the book will be out before Christmas, but we're not promising, but uh, we'll have to see whether they, all the things happen that were supposed to happen. Whenever you do a book, there's always problems, but we hope that they, they've got them all lined out now. So. so, yes, I'd like to uh, thank the society for for its efforts in uh, historical tourism by sponsoring the historical uh, the uh, elder hostel program at Sunday River Inn. As you probably know, for the last two years, Sunday River Inn and the historical society have worked together to sponsor the program, uh, and it's worked very well from our perspective. And I think it has some years. It was a report that uh, money came in and money went out. Some of that money stayed here, not a lot of it. <laughs> but some always does stay. I wonder if I could introduce or have folks introduced to five people that I brought and just tell us your name and where you're from so people know who you are. I'm Henry Woodruff. Uh, I'm a resident of Maine for five months of the year at Goolsboro on the coast, and the other seven months I'm a Jerseyite. <laughs> I'm Mel Vallow. This is my wife, Florence. Uh, we're from Ohio, and uh, you wouldn't believe, unless you've been to Ohio, the contrast in the landscape. We're out there in western Ohio where the land is perfectly flat. It's very fertile. We raise lots of corn, soybeans, dairy cattle, beef cattle, and hogs. And uh, I, we're thoroughly taken up with what you have here, and I hope you appreciate what you have here. I think the video just says, assess your resources. I hope you do that. Good luck. I'm Lorraine Woodruff. I'm Betty Stinton from Columbia, South Carolina. Transplanted the Yankee. <laughs> <laughs> Vermont at the Ramada Inn, 
and I'll bring those around. And we have another recipe for from cider using cider that comes from Essex Junction. So I hope you will enjoy your your this is our